Welcome to episode one of Socialites podcast with me, Gustav Hultgren, as your host. In this series of programs, we will interview persons of interest with connection to Ukraine and seek to inspire and inform listeners about various businesses that our community members are active in. We are always looking for interesting people to interview in this series, so if you do have someone that you want to recommend, please make sure to contact us. You can find our details on our webpage, socialite.nu, or through our Facebook page, of course. In today's episode, we sit down together with Dave Young, a well-known member of the business community in Kiev. Dave has worked extensively together with charity organizations in the country, as well as recent endeavors within the renewable energy sector that Dave was going to be talking more about within the program. But without further ado, here comes the interview with Dave. I hope you enjoy it very much. By the way, if you want to get in touch with Dave about any of his work, either with the charity organizations or his uh, work regarding renewable energy, you can also contact us through our web page. <music> I'm sitting here together with Dave Young. We've uh, known each other for quite a while, and I know that you're up to a lot of interesting things at the moment uh, with your new project, Hashtag Bio. Yep. Uh, so we'll have ample time to talk about that, but I think that uh, probably be interesting for people to hear a little bit who you are and why you're here and what brought you to Ukraine and, you know, all this... Uh, uh, yeah, the usual background stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm British uh, and Irish. It's one of my new nationalities. Uh, need to add to my collection. Uh, I, but I came from Britain into Ukraine. I've been here eight years. I was sitting in an office in England when somebody walked in and went, do you want to start us a new venture up in Ukraine? And I'm like, yeah, Ukraine sounds cool. Where is it? So we got the map out and they're like, here it is. And I'm like, okay, let's go and do it. So we came over for a big corporate, set a company up and expanded quite fast for a markets uh, sector in telecoms. We were building a company up. We went up to about 180 people within about a year and a half, four regional offices, and we turned into quite a big machine. Which year was this? This would have been, come here in April 2005. Okay. So all the big telecom providers were built, desperately building their, their, their networks out, trying to get the coverage, and we capitalized on that. We were working on it. It was all good fun, and then the market conditions changed a bit. The corporate view on risk from the shareholders and where they were working in the, on the market changed a bit. And suddenly we found ourselves sitting in Ukraine with our shareholders wanting to sell us or get out of the country as fast as possible. So kind of at that point, it, nothing in Ukraine is easy. It's nothing, it's not easy to get rid of your assets. There was a few fudged attempts at them trying to get out really quickly and they were finding it really difficult. So we structured a management buyout and at that point, kind of strapped in and you've got no choice you spend all your money on buying something that's going to be beautiful and big uh, then straight away afterwards you're skint and you need to work like a dog to get your money to put back in the company and make it into something big and beautiful so kind of put my head down after that that was after the first three years and uh, started working with the company we went from telecommunications across to engineering to ordinary construction to some security work and moved on and upwards from there into lots of different types of engineering projects and building and, and other project type things. Because you're an engineer. It depends how far back you want to go. I'm an unemployed bum if you go far enough back. <laughs> then I'm a, a semi-unskilled factory worker with a troubled past. Then I'm a bricklayer. Then I'm a building manager. Then I'm a, a late student. Then I'm a ch certified uh, chartered builder. Then I'm a professional project manager. And then I'm uh, in Ukraine. So, yeah, kind of all. But And you said that uh, you're half British, half Irish. I, I was, when I first came, I was all British. But I decided that, you know, it's, it's nice to have an international flavor. So I added Irish about six months ago. And I feel a lot better for it. Why is that? Why is that? Now, I've got, uh, got Irish roots. So I've got grandparents who are Irish. So I thought it'd just be kind of kind of cool to have the extra nationality. Yeah. Maybe we'll go for the Ukraine as the third one. Yeah, within time. Who knows? <laughs> so that kind of brings us up then to right around 2010, something like this. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so we're plundering away, or well, not plundering, blundering maybe is the word, away in the market. We're doing uh, all sorts of unusual projects. We're rolling out some ING banks. We're doing radiation detection systems, airports, reinforcing uh, border points, uh, designing up jails for illegal immigrants on the border, and all sorts of like a weird uh, array of projects or ones that bring nice money to the door and keep you, keep you employed. Well, there's a decision internally, or basically I say internally because it sounds democratic, I wanted to be into green energy or into the renewable sector. Our friends back in England had made a, a nice ploy into that sector and done some good things and looking around how, how to get into it. Uh, the market wasn't really formed at that point. Put together a research team. We're looking at all types of projects, what we could do. Started playing with biomass, uh, started playing with biogas fermentation, went to Germany, made a whole lot of new cool friends, uh, became a fully fledged certified biogas developer, got some partnerships going, came back and nothing. Uh, green tariff took off there was legal problems why biogas never would take off within at that time within the in within the green tariff which is uh like a tariff paid for renewable electricity so everything we we're kind of doing at that moment sort of turned not so great so there was nothing happening with that can i it just to back up the tape a little bit yeah, you said sure. that you were working a lot with uh, government contracts and uh, you know refurbishing of all sorts of i guess which is mostly locked facilities to foreigners i guess in a certain extent how we were doing a uh, radiation detection system on all points of entry to Ukraine. So uh, you're talking ports, airports, border posts, anywhere where people or cargo comes through. So probably, yeah. Maybe Didn't something. you find it very difficult to work as a foreigner to work with in these these sectors? I would picture that it's quite close knit community that is sort I'm of a chameleon. So uh, do you really think I get out and do a day's work? <laughs> so when it's time for the work, everyone's Ukrainian, everyone's security cleared. And there's no foreigners involved. When it come time comes to time to sit down opposite the American contractor, you know, with the right accent, I'm at the table. So you know, you you play it both ways. So it's pretty damn easy. So nearly everyone in our company always has been Ukrainian, apart from me, obviously being non-Ukrainian. So we just had the right security clearances and worked away at it, and had the right licenses, and that didn't seem to be a problem at all. No mountain high enough. Huh? <laughs> it's just business, isn't it? It's just different processes. It's just cracking it open. Where there's a will, there's a way. Where there's a profit, you've got to find it. I mean, this brings us into the question about renewable energy that I know is something that you're burning a lot for mm-hmm. for at the moment with your new product, Hashtag Bio. Uh, can you go through this in sort of a normal person's... Uh, Oh, you mean like an idiot's guide to what's green? Something like that. Okay. Uh, well, just to give a bit of background, obviously our company, Hashtag Bio, which is working in biomass, is a member of the European Ukrainian Energy Agency, which is one of the leading organizations, a member's organization, a non-profit of all the big developers in biomass, uh, energy efficiency, solar and wind in the country. Uh, so within that, I'm the chairman of the board. We represent, uh, we have wind working groups, solar working groups, biomass working groups, energy efficiency, uh, lobbying for, for improvements within the sectors and lobbying is what's good uh, for the renewable sector and for the environment and sort of carbon reduction. Now, maybe three years ago, the green tariff was introduced. The green tariff is uh, a subsidized system where different rates are paid for green electricity to encourage growth within the market, uh, solar, biomass and wind. And this has had a massive effect of bringing in uh, big money to the solar sector. In Ukraine's now got one of the largest solar parks in Europe in Crimea. An explosion in the wind section with not so much online, but a lot of wind developers here plowing millions in and getting ready to build. And the start of life within the biomass sector, which is a slightly more difficult sector. And energy efficiency has endless amounts of money to come from Europe uh, via EBRD, IFC, uh, via donor aid. But it's such a complicated uh, landscape with municipalities, corruption, bureaucracy. That one seems to come down further on the list. But in its own way, uh, developers in renewable energies are international creatures, international funds these days, and they look around the world. And Ukraine's up on the map. It's uh, it's a leading player in in renewable energy now and a lot of the, a lot of the big players are, are, have either come here set up shop or are coming in looking to set up shop do you think that the uh, green tariff is here to stay well technically it's here till 2030 it's uh, having a very troubled life uh, it's been kind of hijacked at one point by some local politicians uh, where they've brought in an onerous rule called the local content ratio which is so much stuff has to be built locally but it's it kind of scuppers the project or kills it because that equipment's not 
available and now there's a backlash politically against that so it's a kind of it's a bit like a war field of people getting different control and people moving it around but i'm pretty sure the green tariffs going to be around for quite a while and i'm pretty sure the renewable market's going to be a big player within the ukrainian economy is it possible for companies to get paid for the ones that do generate electricity in oh, a country is... in a country that that doesn't refund VA how will you how ah, should you expect but, to but, get but, paid for your electricity been, there has been a massive improvement i believe in the VAT situation even that's changed slightly and the system's reforming itself a bit but yeah there's always been a big doubt because one of the biggest problems with the the green tariff is that you can't actually get approval to get your green tariff until you're running and you're on the grid so it's like oh go and build a couple of million you know multi million pound installation then we'll approve it later when you're connected but of course certain players are happy and can mitigate their risk and take that but there's a kind of system that seems to go on the background of grid allocation approvals and i'm pretty sure that the the batch of projects coming through at the moment that they will go on to the on the green tariff they will get paid i've not seen anyone go right to the end and not get connected and get paid but it's uh, it's like everything else in ukraine it's pretty troublesome and it's pretty risky and trying to hedge your bets and make it bankable is a tough job for developers i believe yeah this brings us then closer and closer here to to your your <laughs> own project what is it that you're setting out to do here uh, we're inventing a new technology so we're inventing a new process and our process is in answer to market demands and answer to environmental conditions in the world europe has a massive commitment to reduce its carbon deficit and more renewable energy by 2020 and this is a legislated and enforceable target and within these targets it's causing a massive explosion within the biomass market because biomass is on the cheaper methods of installing renewable energy and dropping your carbon footprint and from now to 2020 the biomass market in Europe is set to explode it'll go from 12 million tons to maybe 24 to 30 million tons it's already gone crazy in uh, Poland and a few other countries biomass is carbon neutral and take the whole thing into consideration so it's uh, it's it's good for the carbon deficit and when you introduce so many millions of tons like an extra 12 million tons of agro waste into the equation you take out 12 million tons of coal which will be burning co2 into the into the atmosphere so with this background we we look to how we could enter the biomass market and what would make a big difference and allow much of the potential that's never been used in Ukraine to come to the market so after sitting down and playing with a lot of ideas we came to the conclusion that one of the things that was going around the world one of the buzzwords which is torrefaction which is uh, an extreme heat treatment of biomass would answer a lot of the questions now I obviously see you look at me a little bit blank like torrefaction uh right we'll do the edits guide to torrefaction torrefaction is a wonderful new buzzword it's what everyone's doing but it's quite an old process if you take coffee bean and you look at how it's roasted into what you have today either crushed into your granules or whatever that's torrefied coffee bean so it's baked at a high temp low oxygen content now if you do that with a material like straw you change its properties one you make it a lot easier to work with and a lot cheaper to process but you also release a little bit of gas which you use in the process to power the whole system and you make it a lot more dense basically what comes out at the other end is slightly carbonized straw that grinds up like coal and you put together back into lumps like coal it can be stored outside and every ton has 25% approximately more energy than a ordinary biomass you've made a, a brown coal lump and this brown coal lump being more energy dense can be transported a lot further can be stored cheaply can be produced more cheaply and burns better with coal so it's like kind of like the intermediate answer to how to jump from a coal economy to a biomass economy pretty damn fast so We're developing our own 100% Ukrainian version of this technology and we're getting ready for a, a big rollout back to back with agro suppliers uh people with waste wood at forestry commissions and all the other agro waste that's not used in the country and try and make the equation work that we can bring large amounts of this waste in supply first of all into the European market then secondly as it grows hopefully into the Ukrainian internal market as well how do you use this product can you burn this in normal burners for heating in buildings or do you need special equipment well, to keep it very simple imagine it like a, a brown coal so you anywhere could, where you use coal today you can use this instead anywhere you use coal anywhere you use biomass so it's like biomass version 2.0 so you go all the world everyone's putting in chp plants uh heating plants all oh, these are run on biomass well ours is biomass as well it's just in biomass slightly improved it goes to a finer powder it burns a bit better has more energy so yeah uh all biomass applications all coal applications 
and it's we've, we've made it more like a, a regular fuel. Are you set in terms of your partners for this project, or are you guys well, still? Well, at the moment, we're on the uh, the mad scientist stage. Okay. So we have this beautiful uh, shiny uh, machine that looks like uh, quite space age and uh, unusual. We, we have. Uh, a rig that produces product. We're getting ready to show the product to end customers, to power companies, and we're getting a lot of interest. And we're starting to talk to people with substrate. The main ones we're hitting first are farmers, but then it'll be forestry people. And we're looking for corporations over the next five years with maybe 15 to 20 different agro holdings where they put the low-grade agro waste in, we put the process in, and we have a back-to-back -back partnership to, to get a decent product, to get a change to the environmental balance, to get profit in their pockets. And... Uh, get a lot of the capacity that's out there not being used onto the market. Well, that sounds great. So when will we see a finished product? Well, we're, going, we're doing what we call proof of concept. And we hope within the next two months we'll sort of be like these sad people walking around with bags of coal going, look at this, man, it's bio coal. Sexy, you want it? And I know it sounds pretty sad like on this, but, you know, to energy companies, I think it is. I mean, we're always starting getting some interest. It's going to be pretty interesting. And I think farmers at that point will look up a little bit more. And then we're going for a, a big run. We're going to try and convert uh, 4,000 tonnes of straw into bio coal in November. I think it'll take us about three months. Then we're hopefully getting straight into production like that. So we've got the big plans because we've got this stupidly large figure tucked at the back of our heads that in five years' time, we want to be doing half a million tons of coal out of Ukraine. Half a million tons of coal, what does that equate to in terms of power generation? Oh, phew, you can get your calculator out, but you're talking every ton has uh, maybe... 20, I mean, is it a half nuclear power plant? Is oh, God, no. You never, 10 you, of you never, want, to, you know you I mean? never <laughs> want to pull the nuclear power plants out because even when you do the coal, you do it for the you're like, oh, the whole water, you know, a few more nuclear plants. <laughs> uh, but it, it's quite... Uh, it's not massive like that because some of the uh, the bigger coal plants in Europe go through millions and millions of tons a year. Uh, but well, it's simple. It'll take out half a million tons of coal. Uh, so it'll make a massive uh, CO2 difference. Yeah. Great. So the uh, the next steps then uh, will be to to do this uh, half a million tons of coal. You said in November. And yeah. The, uh, well, the big the steps are the big steps are is we need to go and get a load more money off a load more people. We need to leave that money to make even more money. But really, we just need to stop talking about it. Go out there and get it done and make something decent. That's great, changing the world. Hopefully, yeah. Best of luck. Half a million tons at a time. It's great. <laughs> that, yeah, that's great. In this project with hashtag bio, presumably you're forming a new company. You're building up that. Are there any any business skills that you think that you need to add for yourself in terms to be able to pull this off? Or wow, these are big intro. Entrepreneur questions, aren't they? I need to add a skill a day, I think. So apart from being, what is it, a brazen bullshit that can sell projects pretty well and, you know, and wing it and go on it, I need to fill in the background past that. So I, I've done building companies up before because we've done that once in Ukraine, so that's right. But there's a lot of new skills, uh, a lot of new financial questions, a lot of new partnerships. But I'm pretty sure as we build the team, and we bring on the skills and the people. The real question is just putting the right teams in, putting the right people, building the right model and uh, no nurturing the right attitude in that model and those teams. The rest just comes down. Do you find it difficult to build uh, businesses and finding good teams? Oh, no. Uh, Ukraine's a gold mine. I mean, there was a bit where it was taking off too fast, where everyone got extremely arrogant because the economy was overheating. But now there's some fantastic resources out there. People aren't as lazy in lots of parts of the economy as they are in Europe. They're not as spoiled. And they kind of realize that no one's really going to dig them out of the hole, that they've got to make it happen for themselves. So I find the resources and the people you get to work here are a lot better than sometimes the teams I get lumbered with in Europe. There's a realism in the market. and No one even looks at you twice and comes up with some stupid comments. They're just people want decent projects and won't work. What do you think, given your experience, what would you see as things that will definitely happen in this country within the next five to ten years? I see economically, it's not the picture of doom that everyone says. I mean, Ukraine, as usual, is playing its one upmanship trying to play Russia off against Europe. But from what I'm seeing, it's kind of committed with the energy community and everything else to being a lot closer to Europe. And on the uh, EUEA side of things, we work with the uh, energy community, we work with the Secretariat, we work with the EIT, uh, transparency guys, and we do see large parts of the economy and the power industries and the energy being dragged 
kicking and screaming towards Europe. This could all be accelerated by a deep and conclusive trade with Europe and the free zones and all that. And that could, you know, make a massive difference. I see the EC guys putting a lot of effort in and I see the Ukrainians playing the usual games with it. But I feel we are kind of moving towards that. And I feel as it gets dragged more towards Europe, even though everyone wrote it off for a long while, we will get a lot closer and we will benefit and business will become a lot more stable. And slowly, slowly, shag as a shag them, it will become a little bit more transparent a little bit more open market for people to come in and with that there will be a general improvement in standard of living I mean IT is doing that already I mean look at the programmers wages they climb every year I was at a conference the other day and somebody was telling me in 10 years they see IT programmers in Ukraine being on equivalent salaries to Europeans but being higher quality workers so you see all these little positive things okay there's some big hurdles to get over but I I see a a general improvement and a a general stabilisation as times go on Is there anything that you would recommend to our listeners i would recommend just get out there and see as much as you can of the different parts of the country all the different flavors how it's completely different from the west and the east get involved in some of the more unusual events in life and smaller things and just take yourself off the beaten path take yourself off the uh the expat bubble that sits in the middle of the maidan and just go out and do a few more things and just get lost in the country and go and go and mix and find things to do and you'll have a wonderful time oh, i went this. once my most random uh, weekends was a weekend of caving in Tsinopol. i bombed in with this group of about 25 ukrainians only one person spoke english we didn't really want to speak it for that weekend <laughs> and it was just ended up in this group going across on a really cheap train and spent three days in this stature and just getting drunk and climbing in caves and going abseiling it was just a wonderful crack i didn't i thought it improved my russian fantastically it didn't no one just understood me but yeah it was a great weekend but it's like last wednesday i found myself in a heroin addiction camp in odessa talking some addicts down there one of our partners on a new project called firefly switlerchuk and it was just amazingly random you get up uh, tuesday night you get on a train Wednesday lunchtime, you're sitting uh, with 15 heroin addicts in the middle of nowhere in Odessa <laughs> talking about their addiction problems. But yeah, it's just, this country's full of that, just uh, random occurrences and lots of things to see and do. You've been very involved in charity throughout. I mean, that's basically how we first met yeah, each other. Yeah, uh, I dropped in with the Kia Lions Club, which is the charity members organization which raises money every year to, what is it, put out amongst suitable projects or the ones it chooses and monitors. Uh, so I was in the Kiev Lions. After about a year, it came up uh, at a kind of random meeting for the election of their president, which they change every year. Somebody threw my name forward. And I'm like, as usual, if there's an unusual question in life, I'm like, uh, okay. So <laughs> suddenly from a meeting, I became their president for about a year and a quarter. Knuckled down to it and thought, well, year, year and a quarter is something different. So we had a, a good year and a quarter. We raised about three hundred thousand dollars and spent three hundred thousand dollars on quite a few different projects. Went out and find some interesting ones. Had some of the guys at our building firm find some and work on them and design them, sort of like pro bono. And that was a very interesting year. Uh, great, uh, great bunch of people down at the Kiev Lines to be working with, and the projects they get involved in are really interesting. The people are really straightforward. It's a different level of society to get involved in. So yeah, that was a fascinating year. And I really, I mean, I'm still involved with the Kiev Lines. I still do a bit on, on other projects at the moment uh, with Svitlachok and Firefly. But yeah, that was a, a forming year. It was very, a lot of effort, a lot of work, but very rewarding and a different, a different view on life. There's a lot of uh, senior, very senior people that are, are working within the Kiev Lions Club. I've, I've attended one or two meetings myself, although I'm not in any way active, unfortunately. But I mean, they're, they're clearly doing a good, lot of good good work. Do you think that there is support in, in society for for this type of activities in Ukraine? Or is this really a, like a, something that is a club for, for foreigners being here that want to do well, something? Obviously, we have important foreigners because we've got Andish in as one of our members. But now, apart from that, it's a great mixture. There's a mixture of uh, expats, Ukrainians, uh, business people, non-business people, charity people, women. It's it's completely uh, across the board. It's it's once maybe had a reputation for being elitist, but now it's it's quite democratic, and there's been a lot of changes in it. And uh, there's very much a need for it. It's not a standalone organisation. Everyone used to think foreigners do. Oh yeah, this is all oh, one of a kind, but it's not. It fits in amongst everyone else. There is a vibrant charity sector and philanthropy sector, especially the philanthropy marketplace within Ukraine with a lot of people doing a, a lot of work. Kiev Lions Club sits in the middle of that, works with all the other organizations, tries to link up and do as many partnerships and cooperations as possible. And 
it plays its part, but it doesn't stand alone because it's uh, it's a growing sector with a lot of good people working in at the moment. Do you see a, a lot of uh, local organizations that are coming in as well? Uh, I see a lot of local... I mean, that are serious. I know that obviously people are very afraid of, of scams and I guess there must have been their fair it's share of, of over that Over the years, problems. I mean, they've been kept quiet and there was quite a few ones that everyone in the sector knew about but nobody would talk about openly. So there have been some major scams but there are definitely some actors and some players on the market now that are local. They're well-funded, have business, have money and are orientated and they're not... I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's just PR, it's show. I don't think so. I think... Uh, comes a certain level of development in some people's and their businesses and they understand what corporate social responsibility is. They understand that if a business is cheap enough just to have profit as its only uh, aim, its people will be cheap and meaningless as well. And that if you want to build a bigger and better organization that grows on its own, you need to have uh, more of a rounded view on life and more of what your position in society is. And I see the starting. I mean, I know everyone says, you know, oh, everyone's cheap, everyone's stealing everything. That's just part of it. There is sectors that are coming forward, there is more and more corporate social responsibility and there's, there's more of an awakening. And there's a lot of things that where people do social good and give money in this country that people just don't see. And therefore they are, it doesn't exist. But it most definitely does. The country doesn't stand on its own like that. Do you think that Ukrainian companies are taking CSRs seriously as well? I mean, where there is no foreign involvement? I mean, I, uh, the reason why I'm asking is that it seems to me like a lot of the big corporations, obviously, in the country are taking this seriously, but my fear is a little bit that maybe they are using this in, in order to be good poster material in order to attract finance from abroad rather than having a serious commitment in themselves. I've often had these thoughts, and it's a nice one, you know, oh, well, who, why are they doing it real motivation? But you've got to remember that really a big company doesn't act, even though it looks like it acts like as one person. It's made up of a myriad of different people and different reasons. And maybe some of them within those reasons have definite PR-facing campaigns. But as long as they're not completely cynical, if uh, a company realizes how the equation works and how to get good PR out of it without being cheap and nasty and exploiting it, it's it's part of the game there's also an internal PR showing you people that you have value that works not just about pure profit and so it's, it's a question that you can get annually obsessed with what you should look at really is the outcome is the outcome that people are not concentrating towards pure profit and looking for a little bit more meaning in life looking around from seeing what the uh, social fabric seeing what the social fiber is you know how it all works now if that's coming together and everything's coming together nicely I wouldn't obsess too much on the other side now of course the biggest sectors at the moment apart from IT is agro and agro has uh, stupidly large amounts of corporate social responsibility to plow back into the country because it's having to invest in areas that are basically feel like they're dying people are moving away and they need to keep communities together otherwise their business suffers and they've only got the dead alcoholics to half their business where they want vibrant communities so in a kind of way people accuse the agros of all oh, just blackmailing here have a community center because we want your land but in the other way they also need to revitalize the countryside and stop it coming apart otherwise they've got no workforce no future so in that way it works perfectly well and there is a lot of money coming into the sector that way and well you know don't want to be cynical about it it does a lot of good i mean i do understand from people especially as you say in in agriculture that there is significant portion of their expenditure budget goes to actually community work some of it maybe not 100 percent voluntarily that they they have to do something in order to get the contracts but by and large i think even when that is the case they are very adamant about deciding where which projects that should be chosen and what that should be done with it so that you know local officials do not get blank checks and, and uh, can blow well, the seeing, money you're seeing it more and more I've seen it with the renewable energy players as well so you've seen the guys come in with the big wind parks the big solar parks massive amounts of money as well and they've all got to have uh, most of the time European financing just like the, the decent agros so to have decent European financing you've got to have apart from corporate social responsibility you've got to have a, a transparent approach and most of the guys attached with it know that showing their share holders that their money's spent properly there's no corruption and it goes to decent social benefit apart from being damn good business sense is it's in tune with their own values 
So yeah, you see more and more of this, not people coming in like, well, here's a massive suitcase of money and we can make something happen. People are saying, well, you know, we've got funds coming in behind us. We're making stable long-term commitments. We need to see uh, social investment and we need to see the social profit. In other words, what benefits and how it doesn't line one person's pocket, how it can make where they're working in the areas and the people are a lot better off. Dave, you mentioned that uh, you're working with a new product called Firefly. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's a project team called Firefly or Svitlyachok in Ukrainian. Uh, some friends of mine, uh, Pedro, Larissa and Rimmer, they've been running the project for maybe a year or two. And it's quite a marvellous initiative to pick up socially disadvantaged youth, mostly coming out of orphanages and children's homes, uh, without much of a formal education and give them a start in life and give them an education and get them trained over six months in basic English, uh, basic hospitality skills, self-confidence, uh, life skills, budgeting, and then get them launched into internships. So it's kind of trying to pick up somebody that's about to drop off the edge, somebody that's not going to get the disillusion with life and try and catch them, bring them back into the system, an intensive burst, get, get them started in life into a, a decent education. They've done a couple of batches. They've had some very uh, good results. Uh, they're gearing up for a, a revamp of the scheme and enlarging it in September. Uh, I've been working on their on their project plans and linking up with some partnerships and trying to get their their new stuff together. And it's uh, it's a marvelous project. I'm really uh, glad to be working because they've got a very fresh energy and a very fresh approach to everything. They are marvelously effective and they will be effective. And it's just something mar- marvelously positive to be uh, to be working on in, in addition to business. And uh, is this project going to run for a long time? Well, they they're, they're working on five. Years. They've already branched into a sub project uh, uh, called Live Lessons, which they've been distributing computers into orphanages in Shitoma, uh, linking them up, uh, getting them onto web resources on England, and running uh, virtual lessons in English with the kids leading themselves, and then bringing them to Kiev every month for a live lesson to give them some sense of community and also to move them on in, the, in, in what they're doing. And that's that's been marvellously successful and they're, they're, they're doing, going to be doing that for another five years and, and taking it out to another region. On the, uh, the, the job starter courses, they're going to be setting that up for five or six years. I said maybe the six month courses will be expanding out to nine months with the new partners they're getting. We're waiting to see, but they're hoping to hit. They're hoping to make a very, very refined and life changing course. And they're hoping to make that pattern stable and expandable so they can take it out as far as possible across different parts of Ukraine. As you've been quite involved in uh, all sorts of different charity projects throughout your time here in, in the country, what would you recommend to someone that is looking to, that is really burning for a course and wanted to set up their own charity? I mean, how would you get started and how would you, you know, try to secure finance and, and uh, some kind of donations? It's a complicated field uh, and reinventing the wheel right from scratch is great. If you've got a, a unique idea, you see a unique need in the market, it's a bit like business, and you feel you can satisfy that need and you have the skills, go for it. If not, uh, maybe you need to pick out some partners, a lot of good partners working in the market that need a lot of help, uh, and it's ways people can apply their skills. So if you're business and you're, you're good at certain sectors of business, you know how to organize, how to be effective, a lot of these charities need consultancy. They have the good idea of how to deliver the social need, they know how to structure themselves, but they don't have such a great organization organization, how to put together effectively larger project plans, how to bring in good connections, how to bring in sponsors. So I would say take a good look at what you see you can fill the need, what you have in the way of skills and try and find a blended match. But it's just like in business. Sometimes it's great to start from scratch and it's really worth it. But sometimes it's better to pick an existing model and people that are doing doing something and partner up with them, especially when you're looking for social benefit. There's a lot of people in it for the wrong idea and there's a lot of people just showboating and wanting to do some good. But charity, corporate responsibility, I always have some people like that. But that's, that's life. Uh, for me, it's I find it an amazingly interesting way to interact with a whole different world of Ukraine that I have no experience of. So you get to go and experience whole new... I mean, at the moment, education. I'm, we're deep into, what is it, flipping the classroom, mastery techniques, latest uh, initiatives from the Khan Academy. And you're getting into them all. And these things I'd never normally touch. But suddenly you've got to gen up on them. You've got to work out what's going on. And wow, it's just really interesting and something different. And you wouldn't come across it in normal business. Charities in Sweden, say the Red Cross, uh, Pink Ribbon, yeah. and Charity Foundation, and all these kinds of things... They are some of the absolutely biggest media buyers in the country. This is extremely striking. I mean, there's so much charity advertising on TV. You're seeing a big swing in the Western charity market. It becomes such big business, but 
you know, good business overall, you know, it's got social benefit, that you're starting to see people sort of jump out of rising careers within pure financial business and choose a less beaten path at the top, but just as challenging where they think and get and jumping across. I and mean, there's been some quite big movers across in London City from financial and moving across some of the big charity funds that were, that were higher players and they just decided, you know, I want something just as challenging, but I actually want to be able to measure my benefit in life. So yeah, it's a changing market, but it is kind of frightening how big business it becomes so fast. Do you think this is also related to uh, social security for people? When people feel, I can put bread on the table, then you have a chance that you can broaden your, your sights a little bit and see what you can do for the society as a whole. I think it's a purely human thing. It's like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's simple. I mean, everyone has needs. So obviously, while you're fighting the wolf in the door or you're, you know, you're looking after your own and defending yourself, you've got time for nothing else. But everyone, as you move up if once you've got one thing under control people look around for what's the value in life and you can only even if you are going the right way you can only make so much money grab so much material stuff and you kind of realize it's, it's all pretty shallow and you're not going to get that far in life and anyone with any decent values or intelligence i think gets to that point and they start looking like what's it about what am i going to do and you realize that a bit of decent interaction and getting people on their way not some i don't actually i don't like the word charity i hate charity i i like uh, social entrepreneurship i like people being able I really hate this uh, concept of uh, giving people and saying, well done, and uh, isn't it sad? You need to give support to where people need it and help them along. And then you'll get some value in life yourself and people will get on and do what they need to do. I can really feel that you're burning for these questions. And I, I can only applaud that, the commitment that you... Uh... Again, I would say, no, no, no way. It's not commitment. This is, you want to live a life. What type of life do you want to live? Do you want to become like a corporate clone? Do you want to make a load of money? Do you want to buy three yachts? Or do you want to get out there and get involved and get involved in a load of crazy projects, meet a load of people that do things, that have values and, you know, they go places? That's me. I want to do something like that. I want, I want to get the most out of life. I don't want to sit there and wait for it to happen to me. I want to get out there and explore what's, what's possible. So, uh yeah, that that concludes my questions for today. I would like I to thank. Got it. The last person. I want you to go out and get one of the uh, the IT guys. Uh, maybe some of the guys from Beecher or something like that. Because these guys, they're out there. They're like pioneers. They're running around Moldova, Odessa. They seem pretty interesting guys. And I I read their blogs. They're obviously very interesting. So yeah, go and grab one of the guys from Beecher and stick him on here for me, please. All right. I'll see if I can grab those guys and get them to sit down for a few minutes when they're in town. But anyway, thank you, Dave Young, a lot for your time. And it's been a pleasure to sit here and talk to you. Always a pleasure with stuff. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the podcast interview with, together with Dave Young. As this was the first interview that we recorded for Socialite, we do know that the sound quality was maybe not 100%. But please do bear with us as we try to correct this for future podcasts. If you are interested in getting in touch with Dave regarding any one of his projects that he's involved in, reach him either through us at socialite.nu or you can, of course, contact him through Facebook. We do hope you enjoyed listening and please make sure to check in on our webpage as we will be launching further podcasting interviews shortly. Thank you.